Give it like 20 seconds. Good evening, Facebook. Today is Tuesday, June 2nd, and this is Off the Plate, presented by Young Gun Umpires. On the panel today, we have our usual four-man crew of Nick Swaha, Sean Garretsey, and Jacob Heath. My name is Nobu Goto, and our special guest for tonight is a graduate of the Harry Wendelstedt Umpire School in 2011, a current AAA crew chief in the International League, and made his Major League debut this past season. He wears number 66 on the big league field, Alex Tosi is here with us tonight. Alex, thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, before we dive into what we have for tonight, uh, for those watching, please do make sure you give the video a like, share the video, tell any umpire you know that may benefit from what we're doing here about our group. And as always, thank you so much for your support. Uh, so Alex, first and foremost, how'd you get into umpiring and what took you to umpire school? Um, so after I graduated college, um, wasn't really sure exactly what I wanted to do. Um, knew that I wanted to stay in baseball somehow. Um, but you know, like most people you know, realize at some point that wasn't good enough to keep playing, um, had umpired a little bit, you know, throughout college, nothing, you know, anything formal, just doing some, some kids games and stuff here and there. Um, Still to this day, don't know exactly where I got the idea from. I think I just kind of gave it to my dad one day and he did what he always does and just kind of ran with it and then uh, looked up, did all the research for me, looked up, um, decided, um, found Harry Wendelstedt School and um, decided, hey, spending five weeks down in uh, Florida in the middle of January, you know, better than Illinois winter. So uh, gave that a shot and worked out. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of uh, one misconception I had before I went to umpire school was that you sort of needed to work like a lot of college baseball or a high level amateur baseball kind of going in until uh, someone who's a lot smarter than me told me that that's like not a prerequisite or a requirement at all. So having going to gone to umpire school, not having umpired much was did you feel like you were ever at a disadvantage while you were there? Um. So I did get to go um, to a weekend clinic that Wendelstedt put on in Chicago, which I think honestly made all the difference for me. Um, just having a couple of days of knowing the type of training they do exactly, you know, having an idea of what it is they're looking for, um, I think did give me a leg up. Um, but one thing that I learned when I was down there that they actually prefer guys to not really have a lot of experience because they can mold you how they want you. Um, instead of, you know, working, you know, ball with, you know, guys that don't have a lot of formal training, you may pick up some bad habits from, from places, um, you know, watching big league guys on TV, you can do that, you know, when you're, you know, when you get to that level, but, you know, as a guy going to umpire school, you have to work a certain way. Um, so for them to be able to mold you from, you know, from scratch, how they want you actually was, uh, it was probably beneficial that I hadn't umpired a whole lot, to be honest. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, it's always, it's always fun and all to watch like all the big leaguers kind of doing their own thing, running their games. But uh, when, um, when I teach new umpires coming into our local associations, I try to tell them to uh, watch uh, major league call-ups like you, because uh, you will go by the book. You will uh, do everything the way it's supposed to be done by the supervisors and, and you guys always run a really clean game, both at AAA and at the big league level. Um, so I, th I think you, now it, it, it's really awesome to kind of watch someone that was at umpire school at one point kind of be that guy I look up to and try to learn as much from on TV. Yeah, it's fun getting to see the guys that I came up with, you know, working with them at different levels, seeing the way that they develop over the years. Because, um, you know, you really don't know. There's a lot of guys, you know, may have had it from, from day one and they just don't really develop how, you know, how they thought they would. Um, and some guys, you know, it just takes them a little bit longer. Um, the ones who make it to the big leagues quicker than others doesn't necessarily mean that they're, 
better umpires. Maybe they just, it just took them a little bit longer to get there. Um, but to see the finishing product on, uh, on some of these guys that, you know, you've known for a decade, um, is really cool. Cause these guys, I mean, you're, you're competing for a job with them, but they're also your friends and, you know, you're rooting for them, even though maybe if they get a job, maybe that means that you don't get a job, but everybody's pulling for each other and trying to learn from each other. Yeah, absolutely. I think a, a great line that came up during our last episode with, uh, with American Association umpire Chris Lee was that, you know, umpire school, contrary to popular belief, is not like the Hunger Games. Everyone's pulling for each other. Everyone's working hard, cheering for each other. It's, it's a really good and fun environment. So now Jim you Kirk. were an athlete growing up, um, coming up, and then, then you transitioned to being an umpire. Could you just take us through what that transition was like? And did that help you, uh, that knowledge of being an athlete, help you become an umpire? Uh, yeah, I, th- I do definitely do think it did. Um, it, uh, playing the game your entire life, you have uh, a natural feel for it. Um, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to translate into being a successful umpire, but um, to to have that, that look that an athlete does, you're going to, you know, maybe um, – you have that, you have that little, that presence on the field, um, players, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of what they perceive of you, whether you're right or wrong is the way that you look while doing your job. Um, so to have that, you know, natural feel for the game, um, I think that kind of, that kind of resonates with players. They kind of, they don't see you as one of them, but they, you know, they, they may show you a little, you know, a little more respect. Um, but it was for me, it was easy to transition from being a player to being an umpire. Um, to me, you know, I, I love the game of baseball. Um, it was hard to stop playing. Um, but after doing this job for a little bit, I quickly realized that, you know, I might actually be better at umpiring than I was at playing. And there was a lot more of an upside. I was never, you know, never had a chance to make it into the big leagues as a, as a player. Um, but I thought, you know, this is a way to, to stay around the game and to do something that I love doing and still, you know, 10 years later, I still love doing it. Yeah, that's amazing. So you have those accolades as a player, you go to umpire school, you're uh, one of the fortunate ones, uh, good enough to get a job. So now kind of looking at where you are in your career right now, if you could kind of go back in time and give some advice to yourself when you were in short season, when you were in A ball just starting out at the bottom of the ladder, what advice do you have for yourself or somebody in that position? Um, One thing that took me a little while to learn was to work the level that you're at. Everybody, when they first get in, they want to be a major league umpire. They watch major league umpires on TV and they want to work like that. That doesn't work. There's, there's a process to get to where you are. And there's a reason that they have the developmental program set up the way that it is. Um, It's, you know, you, you start out doing the basics and everybody, oh, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm better. I can, you know, I can do this. I can do that. I see this on TV. I can do that. Um, It's, it's tough to work, you know, when you're in short season, you know, you've got to work the hammer. You got to be very robotic. You know, you can't even point strikes at that point. Um, but just, you know, trust that the process that they have in place is what it is. It's there for a reason. It's, you know, all these guys that are your supervisors, they've all gone through it. It will get to you. You will get to where you want to be. Just work the level that you're at and, and progress, you know, the way that they, you know, the way that the program's set up. Yeah, the system is definitely in place uh, for a reason. You start out with two man, kind of learn the fundamentals there, achieve mastery of that system before you go to three and four man at the higher levels. So could you just talk a little bit about what was the biggest transition, kind of the learning curve from going to running a two man system to a three man system in double A and then running some four man in triple A? By far, I think the hardest transition is going from two man to three man. Um, the three man to four man is the same general concept, but to go from two to three, you go more from umpiring, you know, you see the ball, here's where I'm supposed to go. You don't really have to feed off your partner. Three man is all about looking at your partner. You know, there's one person that's going to be reading it and 
he may get the wrong read, but you have to cover for him. You know, if the first base umpire decides he needs to go out on the ball and third base umpire thinks it should be his, well, you got to rekey off the first base umpire. So a lot of guys, when they first get into working the three-man system, really have a hard time of don't let the ball dictate where I need to go. Let my other umpires dictate where I need to go. Um, as the ball's rolling around in the outfield, you know, you're constantly looking at the infield, checking your partners. Hey, is my plate guy rotating up to third base? Is everybody where they need to be? Um, so to, to try to break that mold of being in two man, just being okay, focus on the ball. Here's my runner. You have a whole lot of other stuff going on and it takes, it mean, it, it really takes probably a full season in double a to truly be comfortable with, um, the three man system, knowing that, you know, as soon as the ball's hit, I can just let my instincts take over. Um, but you really have to. I mean, before every pitch, tell yourself, okay, if this the ball's hit here, I'm going here. If the ball's hit here, I'm going here. Um, because until you have the, the mastery of the three-man system, if you just try to react when the ball's hit, your wheels are going to start spinning. The guy's going to get a bad read, and you know, everything's going to break down. So it's a it's a real tough transition from from A ball to double A. Yeah, Alex, can you just uh, talk about like the importance of knowing and having that fundamental of two-man? to later move up to those uh, three man and four man? Yeah. Um, in, uh, in a two man system, you know, you, it's, it's not as, as fun to work as three and four man because there's, you know, certain restrictions. You always got to stay ahead of your place. So you may not get the, the optimal look. Um, but in order to make that jump into three man, you have to know why you're doing everything. And two man really does give you the fundamentals um, as far as just the, the kind of the baseline of umpiring, um, you may know that, Hey, this is, you know, this is exactly where I need to be to take this play, but in the two man system, Hey, I got another runner in front of me. I got to stay ahead. You know, I can't get, I can't get sucked into my play just to get the, the optimal look when I'm responsible for three other bases. Um, so while, you know, two men, you may, a lot of times your head spinning, not knowing where the ball is going, you got so many places to cover. Um, you really have to have that baseline. You, you can't just jump into a three-man system um, without having mastered the two-man system um, because the, the three-man system is just too, too intricate. There's too many things going on that unless you have that baseline, you're, you're going to be completely lost out there without it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a whole other thing that dynamic that gets added when you're in a three-man crew is now you have another partner. Uh, you, now it's three people, three personalities, three people in the car uh, driving everywhere. Um, in professional baseball, you know, it's just the three of you for the whole season. So could you talk, just talk a little bit about um, uh, importing, the importance of being a good partner on and off the field, especially in that three-man dynamic where it's multiple relationships uh, over the course of a season? Yeah, it's, uh, it's great having a third person there, just, you know, spending – five month season with two people uh, it gets to be a bit monotonous so to have a third person there is you know it's amazing like just your off you know off the field life is you know a lot better um but one thing I've always in, in you know a lot of the guys in the big leagues you sometimes being a a good umpire off the field is maybe even more important than being you know a good partner on the field um if you mess up a call, you know, I can fix it. I can, you know, I can manage the situation. If you are a bad person and not somebody that I want to be around, it's going to be five months of that, you know, you're going to make my life miserable. Um, so just to be somebody who, you know, always got your partner's back, you know, you, maybe, you know, you guys have different interests, you know, you know, some guys maybe like to go out to the bars afterwards. Some guys maybe, you know, like want to stay in more that, you know, find that balance in that to be a good partner and things will take care of themselves on the field. Um, but it's a long season. And if you can't find a way to get together with your, get together with your partners and, you know, have a good time, it's, uh, you know, like it's going to make life hell. I've been fortunate that every partner that I've had, um, I've got along with great, um, in a ball, especially if you have one partner you don't like, that's, you know, you're stuck with them. Um, at least in double a triple a, you got, you got two guys. So, you know, there's another guy at least for you to hang out with. Um, but I've been, been very fortunate with the, the guys that I've had. They're great umpires and phenomenal people too. 
Yeah, you mentioned that, you know, the season is really long in professional baseball. So, you know, at, at any point, the, the like, like there's going to be a point, I think, for anybody, no matter what level they work, you kind of hit a wall. You know, the season feel like feels like it's going forever. So what are some things you like to do to kind of break up the monotony of a long baseball season? Uh, one thing recently that I've tried to make more point of doing is getting out and seeing the city when I'm in it. Um, it's easy to just get into a rut of, Okay, I wake up, uh, I go to the gym, then I go to lunch, and then I take a nap, and then I work my game, and you go in and out of cities, and you never really get to see it. Um, especially, you know, as I'm starting to go up and down, getting to see some of these, you know, I go out west, never spent a whole lot of time out west, you know, going to San Diego, Seattle, seeing these ama amazing cities. Um, I've tried to spend as much time as I can during the day getting out, you know, go out to lunch, go for, you know, a walk, go for a bike ride, just kind of um, get to see the city because this job allows you the ability to see the country like almost nobody else gets to. And um, I think there are probably a lot of guys that get out and realize, man, I've traveled the country, but I've never really seen the country. I've seen the inside of my hotel room and I've seen a ballpark and didn't really see a whole lot more outside of that. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it's it, it's definitely a privilege to be able to kind of just go around the whole country, see new cities on on uh, and get paid for it. It's uh, one of the pros of being an umpire. So uh, now you're in double A, you're in triple A and uh, you're a crew chief. Um, how does being a crew chief kind of having all of that extra responsibility, does that change your approach to a game, especially on days where you don't have the plate, but you're on the bases still as a crew chief? Uh, yeah, there, there's definitely a, a, um, a different level of focus that you have to have. Um, at any point, something could go wrong and you let your guard down for a minute, it's all going to fall back on you. Ultimately, when you know something breaks down with the crew, the crew fails, you fail. It's going to come back on you. Um, you know, if you're a, if you're a two man or three man, you have a little bit of protection that, you know, hey, this, he's not in charge, you know, we're going to hold him responsible, but ultimately he's not the one in charge. So whether or not it was, you know, if something were to happen, whether or not it was my mistake, it ultimately, you know, the buck stops with the crew chief. Um, so knowing the, the strengths and the weaknesses of the guys that you're working with, um, you know, it, there, there are some guys that are, you know, better with the rules than others. Um, you know, if you have a guy that, you know, Hey, this is a guy I can rely on as far as, you know, if there's, we get into a pickle, Hey, I know this guy knows the rules as well as anybody else. Um, so just, just working, you know, as, as you get to know your partners, knowing their strengths and their weaknesses and really building that relationship as the season goes on. Um, it, it's really great to see as, you know, after you work some games together, how that dynamic, how you guys start to, to mesh together and come together as a crew. Yeah. I think that, I think that's like one of the most, uh, rewarding aspects of uh, working a professional baseball season of once you work, you know, a hundred some games together, like you're the whole crew will always be on the same page, no matter what. And like, especially at a double a game, a triple a game, the, the movements of the umpires will be like clockwork. And I think that's a really awesome thing to see when I watch, uh, watch those games. So now you're in triple a and this past season, uh, you're fortunate enough to, to get the call that a lot of umpires would, only dream about uh, you get the call to work your first big league game Can you just take us through what that day was like uh, what the phone call was like and uh, I'm sure there was a last second flight involved too in that story um, so <laughs> the phone call actually was uh, something that my boss will never forget um, because I got called and um, there were two two of my supervisors were on the phone and I remember the, well, one of my supervisors, so he actually grew up where I went to college. And I remember he asked me, he goes, um, hey, what's the name of that, uh, that newspaper in Bloomington again? Is it the, the Panagraph? I'm like, yeah, why? He goes, well, why don't you uh, give him a call and tell him you're going to be working in Minneapolis next weekend. As soon as he says that, the audio on my phone died. I started talking, nothing came out. I hung up, called him back again, nothing hung up. He calls me back again. Nothing. I have to send him a text. Hey, sorry. My phone is on the fritz. It did this once before I have to turn it off or turn it back on. Let me call you back. So I finally call him back and the audio is working and he's just like, Hey, so you know, this money that you're about to uh, get for working the big leagues, 
why don't you take that money and go get a new phone? <laughs> I immediately went out, bought myself a new phone. I was like, what are the chances of one time in the, five, the three years I've had this phone, one time it has done this and then all of a sudden craps out the biggest call of my entire life. Um, so fortunately they gave me a, a week notice, uh, one week's notice because they, um, if they can, they want to you know, be able to give you some time so you can have family come in and that, and also try to keep you somewhere relatively close to home. Um, I don't think they ever will give you a game in your hometown just because that can be kind of overwhelming to have everybody there. Um, so they gave me my game in Minneapolis, you know, only about an eight hour or so drive from Chicago. So I was able to have my, uh, my parents um, and then some of my closest friends, uh, they were all able to, to come out for the game. Um, and yeah, it was, you know, every bit as amazing as you could, you could imagine. Right. So now in amateur baseball, you know, obviously um, umpires are always working with someone new uh, literally every single day. It's kind of you're always making introductions uh, during the season as opposed to professional baseball. So now you go from being a triple A crew chief, you're shuttling up and now you're the the low man on a brand new crew. So could you just talk a a little bit about the importance of uh, making a really good first impression with uh, some people you're about to work with for the first time? Yeah, the um, one thing that I've always I've really tried to do um, is try to listen as much as you can. Um, a lot of the guys get the misconception of listening means, you know, don't talk, you're, you know, invisible. These guys still want to get to know you. You know, they, they're not going to want to work a season with a guy that's, you know, just sits in the locker room and doesn't ever say anything. So they want to get to know your personality. Um, but at the same time, you know, in any given locker room, there's 80, 100 years worth of experience in that locker room. There is so much that you can learn from each of these guys. Um, you know, some, you know, good, some things that, you know, you don't want to do, but just to try to pick their brain as much as you can. Um, they're, you know, some of the most amazing people I've met are umpires. You know, obviously it takes a certain personality to do this job. Um, and, you know, I was fortunate enough to work, I've worked about the last month and a half or so of the season, um, but got to work with two different crews, uh, for the entire month. So I was able to stay with the crew for a couple of weeks, um, and actually get to know the guys and, you know, get to hang out with them, get to know them a little bit on a, on a personal level, um, which was, you know, it was great, but, you know, any, anybody that is working, you know, any, for anybody coming, you know, up through the minor leagues, uh, don't ever be. Uh, intimidated by, you know, hey, this guy's a big leaguer. Hey, this guy's in AAA. They, they want to get to know, you know, talk, you know, talk less and listen more, but also, you know, let them get to know you show off your personality, let them, you know, feel kind of feel you out and know what kind of person you are. Yeah, absolutely. I think some of the closest friends I've made over the last five years are all umpires. You know, it's just something about our craziness or quirkiness or whatever that just call, that makes us mesh together, even though we might have uh, all have different personalities. So now that and this isn't a question so much so directed at you, but um, anybody going up and down uh, between AAA and the big leagues, is there is it difficult to kind of work with uh, a bit of uncertainty, not exactly knowing where you'll be at uh, in a week, a week in advance or anything like that? Uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a bit stressful to always have to have your phone on you at every, every point in time. You know, if my boss calls me at 3 a.m. saying, hey, you, we need you tomorrow and you need to catch a 6 a.m. flight, he expects you to answer your phone. Um, I, get, I, I go take a shower. I have to have my phone in the bathroom with me because, God forbid, that my, my special ringtone for the, for the guy who assigns us that goes off. I have to have it on me at all times. So that is, um, that's pretty stressful, you know, always having to be on call. Um, but it's, um, it, it's kind of, it's fun though, because it's such a, a different dyna- dynamic than what you're used to. You know, you get your, you get your schedule at the beginning of the season and you know, every single day, here's where I'm going to be. Well, now for the first time in nine years, I don't know where I'm going to be every single day. Um, so, this, it takes a, you know, it takes a toll on, you know, on your personal life. 
um, but it also is, you know, it's, it's a nice, it's a nice change of pace to be, to be on the fly all the time. Yeah. In the, in the words of, uh, of somebody who's very influential in, um, in the umpiring world, you have to be a good employee mm -hmm. as an umpire. Yeah. Um, they, uh, th th that's, that really is one of the biggest things that, that the major league office looks for. Um, they don't want to invest 20, 30 years in a guy that is going to be a problem for them. Um, you know, if obviously you want to get, you know, the best umpire, you know, ball strike safe out, but you'd rather have a good employee, somebody that's not going to hurt the major league baseball brand. And maybe he's not quite as good at calling balls and strikes as somebody who's, you know, a firecracker that you never know, you know, what he's going to do on any given day. So it is very important to the office that um, you're a good employee. You do what you're told, you know, you got your head on your shoulders and you're not somebody that's going to ruffle feathers. Yeah. The umpire, obviously his role is to protect the integrity of the game, but I think what a lot of people uh, need to realize is that a lot of times the umpires sometimes are the only point of contact at that ballpark for that league. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's absolutely um, necessary that the league can trust uh, their umpiring staff to just do all the necessary things off the field, all the paperwork and, and whatnot, and can be, a, and can be held accountable. Um, otherwise um, it just creates a bad image for the league. Yeah. And I mean, you, you, you need to be somebody that they can trust is always telling the truth. Um, you know, if you mess up, own up to it, you know, maybe they slap you with a fine, but if they know that you're somebody that, Hey, this is what happened. And the manager's account of what happened is different. And they can say, look, this guy has never lied to me. He has, you know, fessed up when he, you know, used language on the field that he wasn't supposed to. I know it's the guy that I can trust. So while it's a, you know, he said, she said type situation. Well, I'm going to go with, you know, what this guy said, because he's proven to me that he will not lie to me. And, you know, if you ever were to break that trust with your league, that's a huge problem. So being somebody that, you know, can be held accountable, that will hold yourself accountable because we all make mistakes. Um, I've said things on the field that I absolutely should not have. I immediately got in, got in the car, called up the league president and said, here's what I said. And, you know, Whatever you can do about it, go ahead. I just want to let you hear it from me first. This is this is what happened. Yeah, and what's really important is we always hear that baseball is a microcosm of life, and you learn many life lessons from this. And what you're saying is right now is you can take all these skills you learn as an umpire and take it and do your real job as well. Always listening, always fessing up to mistakes, all, all doing all that stuff. And your your real employer is going to be even more thrilled with that. So. Yeah, it's a, uh, this job really translates into so many different other professions. Um, so much of life is dealing with people. And that is probably the biggest part of umpiring is, is managing people. And whether, you know, if this career is over, you get into, you know, working in the business world or whatever it is, um, there's a lot of skills that you learn from this job that really translate and, you know, make, just makes you a, a good employee and, um, you know, in, in many different fields yeah kind of on the same note of uh just doing the necessary off the field uh what about in the off season do you have like a routine uh what are things you do in the off season to just uh, get ready for your upcoming season uh well it kind of depends on um if i have any off season assignments from baseball um there so i've worked not this past year but the year before i worked two years of fall league um so when you have an off season assignment that, you know, even just a six week long fall league, now your you know, five month season or five month off season turns into three months. Um, so there's not really a lot of time to you know, get a job or, or whatnot. So um, one thing I've, I've found that I've kind of struggled with is getting into uh, a routine in the off season. Um, you know, you want to get away from, you, you want to get away from baseball. You know, if that's, you just live and breathe it, it you know, you're going to burn out. Um, so when I'm not, you know, working baseball, I, you know, very, very rarely, uh, work it during the off season, uh, plus living in Chicago, it's freezing in the middle of winter and I have no choice and I can't umpire baseball even if I wanted to. Um, but I've kind of struggled with getting into a routine because I'm, I'm somebody who likes to have a routine, but I'm not great at making my own, you know, I kind of like to, I like to have that structure, but 
um, it's almost okay. Here's your schedule. You're working the game here, then you travel here. Um, so having that freedom of three months of, Hey, I have nothing to do. Um, filling that with, you know, whether it's getting a job, doing some volunteer work, teaching clinics, whatever. Um, it can be kind of difficult to go from being gone all the time to now having all of the time in the world. And, you know, it, it's kind of, it's kind of tough when most people are in between those two extremes. Yeah, I think definitely working in professional baseball will will separate um, who's who's good at making routines during the season. You know, waking up, maybe working out, grabbing lunch with the crew, and then you know taking a nap or whatever, going to the game. Uh, while uh, somebody who may not uh, succeed as much on the field, it, it'll show off the field of maybe they're a bit all over the place in terms of. Uh, how they uh, manage and organize your life. Uh, Jacob, I know you got something on this note. Yeah, uh, you know, Alex, I think that one thing that you kind of made me realize more too uh, on the fact of the matter of having your off season is that, you know, we, we when I say we, I speak for everybody lower than I guess you could say the major league level um, and obviously the professional level as well. But as far as all that goes is asking, is that we're, we're, we're so looking forward to asking these these big league guys uh, that have worked through some of them through the postseason and have gone all the way to the World Series. And we're asking them to give their time and effort even more away from their families in the offseason uh, to these clinics, to these camps. And everybody thinks it's just uh, so easy uh, for them to just give their time and effort. And, and it's, it's, it's more time consuming away from their family. And I, I guess, not that I didn't realize that, but I guess that made more sense to me just now when you were talking about when you got to sign the fall league and, you know, now it's it, now instead of it being however long, six months now, we're, we're talking about uh, eight or nine months, you know, and uh, I, I guess that's something to look at, too, when you and appreciate more when you see those big league guys out there, guys like you giving your time and effort uh, to these camps and clinics in the offseason. Uh, and that's something to be commended for. So um, I, I appreciate that realization for sure. Yeah, yeah. Some of these guys that, you know, that have families, the it's it's tough to strike that balance. Um, you know, I, I don't have a family of my own, so. Um, it's a lot easier for me to be on the road. Um, the big league guys, you know, they get to, you know, they get vacation time, you know, they can fly home for off days. So they, they do get to, um, they do get to come home and see their family. You know, they don't spend too terribly long, depending on what their schedule is like, um, without going home. Um, but you know, guys that are in the minor leagues, I, I have no idea how they do it. I, I commend them for it because raising a family and you don't get to come home. You come home for the all-star break and that's it. And then if you're working the all-star break, you literally don't see your family from, you know, spring training time until, you know, early September, you go five, six months without, without actually being able to sleep in your own bed and only getting to come out when your family does. So how those guys do it is, you know, I, I commend them for it. It's, that's a, a work-life balance that I'm not sure that I would be able to strike. So the fact that they can do it is, is amazing to me. Yeah, thanks for saying work-life balance. I, I just graduated college, and that was a huge thing that I that was taught to us was work-life balance, and we continually have to push for that um, throughout it all. Um, and we continue to just keep talking about um, having time off the field and all that. In amateur baseball, that's even becoming an issue now with the lack of umpires. We see so more and more umpires have to be constantly be on the field whether it be in season, off season, what all that stuff. So um, I feel like the lifestyle of a college, maybe a D1 college umpire is more relating, related to a minor league umpire in, the, in some regards. Yeah. Uh, the, the amount of time that those guys put in traveling in, you know, in college ball too, uh, and then having to work a full-time job. I mean, that's, that's dedication there. Um, you know, during that, you know, four months or whatever the season is to be away from home that much putting in, you know, working a 40 hour work week and then working, you know, five or six games on top of that um, is, is pretty amazing. You know, I, I complain sometimes about, you know, the travel that we do, um, but it could, it could always be worse. And, you know, you have worked, you know, going back, just working, you know, high school games for, for fun every once in a while. And, you know, seeing these guys that work, you know, 10 games in a weekend, I'm just like, I, I will never complain about having to wake up and work a double header when you're out here working for 10, 12 hours straight in 90 degree heat. Like that's, <laughs> that's amazing. 
Yeah, I know uh, for me being a teacher, um, trying to find balance of, of being able to teach, which is my day job, and then working my college games um, has, has been a struggle for the first couple of years that I've been in, in college ball. So for me, um, you know, really balancing work and, and umpiring um, took some adjustment. So I, I do appreciate the insight into, uh, you know, kind of sharing how you, how you spend your off season and, and really the, the structure that you guys are provided. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so now, Alex, you've, uh, you've done your work in the off season, you've done your due diligence, and now you find yourself in that high intensity, high pressure game. How do, how do you kind of, I don't know if cope is the right word, but how do you deal with like the magnitude of a whole stadium watching you, um, a game coming down all the way to the wire? How do you deal with that pressure during those games? Um, you just got to remind yourself that this, it's the same, it's the same game. Uh, I remember, you know, before my first, um, before my first game I ever worked, you know, just telling myself before the game, this is just another game. It's not, but it, it's still, it's just, it's baseball. You know, it's the same, it's the same game that I've been working for nine years up to that point. You know, the baseball is still the same size. The bat's still the same size crowds a little bit bigger, but it's still just baseball. Um, so to just kind of remind yourself, Hey, I, I deserve to be here. I belong here um, to kind of give yourself that confidence that, you know, I am not, you know, out over my skis right now. I, I, I belong to be here. Um, and, but the, the first time that you, you know, for that first base hit when 40,000 people, the noise that you've never heard, it's, Oh, wow. This is, this is a little bit different. Um, but you just kind of got to, you know, try to, not to worry about all the other stuff going on, all the crowd, just remind yourself, Hey, just take it one pitch at a time. Um, you know, it doesn't matter if it's um, you know, if you're working a, you know, a game in AAA at the end of the season and, you know, two teams that are out of the, out of the playoff hunt and the game doesn't matter. Or if it's, you know, bottom of the ninth, you know, bases loaded two outs in the big leagues, it's still the same game. Just take it, take it pitch by pitch. Yeah, absolutely. The game's never changed in a hundred years. It doesn't have to change when, um, when all the pressure in the world is on you. So now as we kind of wrap up here tonight, um, I want to bring it back to the, um, to umpire school. And Alex, if you were to come across somebody, somebody were to come up to you, a young umpire, maybe not that experienced, uh, and he or she is 50, 50 on going to umpire school or not. Uh, what, what are some uh, words of advice you would have for that person that's interested in uh, the idea of going to umpire school? Um, I think the biggest thing is to understand what the lifestyle is like. Um, to, to, it, it's nice to go to umpire school and be, you know, 23 year old kid. That's just like, Oh, I think this would, would be a great job and not really, look at, okay, what is this, what are the next 10 years of my life really going to entail? Um, so somebody who isn't sure, ah, is this, is this really for me? You really need to be honest with yourself. Is this lifestyle what I want to do? Am I going to be okay? You know, five years from now, still not to the big leagues yet being gone from home, you know, 180 nights out of the, out of the year. Um, because if you're not okay with that, when you first get in, you're certainly not going to be okay with that five years from now. And there's a lot of people that I, I don't know for sure, but I would say there's a lot more people that from A ball to double A quit on their own than actually get released. Um, because eventually they just decide, you know, I can't, I can't do this lifestyle being gone all the time, being in hotels all the time. Um, you meet a girl and just, you know, Hey, being married and this just don't mesh. Um, so I think the biggest thing is not even necessarily on the field. Is this a job I want to do? It's off the field. Is this a, is this a balance that I'm going to be able to, to do? Is this a lifestyle that, that I want? Yeah. I think if this job is for you, there's uh, there's nothing more fun, um, nothing more fun than being a professional umpire. If it's, if it's not for you, it, it, like you said earlier, a five month season can feel like a 10 month, 10 month season. Um, 
But yeah, before we wrap up, uh, I know Jake, you got a point um, you want to make. You know, I just want to say to the to the guys that are watching and the guys that are going to watch this video, you have to remember why we're doing things like this, these interviews. Um, I mean, it's been really cool to talk to some of these guys, man, especially like you, Alex. I mean, I, I was I was in tune the whole time. I mean, I, I, I love this stuff, man. I love hearing how the intricacies work, how, you know, that that the story of the phone call, it, it sends chills down my body, man. I would just I could not imagine I can not even imagine being in your shoes and getting that phone call. And, but, but it's so, although it's cool to interview all of these people, right. And we've had some really good names on here, some really big names. We're going to continue to have other big names on here. You have to remember that young gun umpires that we're working to create a new standard, meaning we want to give everybody um, all the information in the world at every level possible. There's a reason why we've had just high school guys on here. We've had pro guys on here. We've had college guys on here. There's, uh, you know, and, and as far as independent baseball, we're trying to give everybody as many avenues as possible to understand that not everybody's meant to be a big league umpire, uh, but wherever you're at, try and be the best umpire that you can possibly be. And uh, more importantly, be the best person that you can be and understand that there's so much more to this than umpiring. There's so much more that comes with this uh, and it's a blessing. So I just want to remind everybody of why we're actually doing these interviews and why we started doing what we're doing is to create as many avenues as possible. Uh, to help the newer and younger generation of umpires. Yeah, it's really well said, Jacob. Um, Alex, I think I can speak for uh, all of us and everyone watching. We're uh, really excited to see where your career is going. Uh, we're we're going to continue to watch you, continue to learn from you. Uh, this was an absolute pleasure. Uh, this has been Off the Plate presented by Young Gun Umpires. And until next time, we'll see you between the white lines. Thank you ever so much for watching. Please remember to like, share share the page, tell your friends about it. And again, thank you all for your continued support.